Thank you very much, Lorraine, and many thanks for the invitation to speak to you today. If you can't hear me, please do say, and I'll try and lurk closer to the microphone. So, so I gave the title today, The Role of Diet and Lifestyle in the Primary and Secondary Prevention of Chronic Disease. Clearly, that's a very broad title, and it's unlikely that I'm going to cover the full spectrum of um, diet and lifestyle in primary and secondary prevention of all chronic disease. So I've na narrowed it down a little. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about nutrition research at Queen's first, as, as Lorraine has alluded to. Um, we cover a broad range of nutrition approaches, um, so we're interested in the use of biomarkers to better measure dietary intake. Um, we use very sort of standard epidemiological research methods, but a more recent interest is around looking at behaviour change and how we get a population to change its behaviour. Um, we focus at all ranges of the life, life cycle, so we have ongoing studies in, in ch uh, children, um, in pregnancy, in at-risk populations, and then in the ageing and chronic disease area. Um, and I suppose in terms of themes that we're interested in, weight management is one, micronutrients and micronutrient switch foods is another, and then this whole concept of looking at dietary patterns and overall diet, and then linking that in with uh, lifestyle as well. Slightly complex in terms of the nutrition setup, which I don't need to trouble you with, um, but I would say that we have academics at Queen's who range right through from very much public health nutrition, right through to just like yourselves in your school, uh, people who are much more interested in the agriculture and food production and indeed food safety side of things. So that's a little bit of background to Queen's. So in terms of chronic disease, I'm going to focus on uh, heart disease. Um, simply because I think probably it's the most prevalent uh, chronic disease worldwide. So this is uh, data from the um, Global Burden of Disease study from 2010, um, showing that whether you look at deaths, whether you look at years of life lost, or whether you look at disability adjusted life years, ischemic heart disease is at the top of the pile. If we look at change over time, you will also see that over time we're seeing this is between 1990 and 2010, um, that ischemic heart disease has risen to the number one uh, cause of death worldwide. And those more traditional communicable diseases um, are reducing in prevalence. So this is now no longer heart disease or disease of affluence. It's a common disease worldwide. Whether diet has and physical activity and other lifestyle behaviours has a role to play in the global burden of disease has also been examined, again using the global burden of disease study. Um, and it was estimated that dietary risk factors and physical activity, if you looked at them together, collectively accounted for about 10% of global disease burden. And you can see in the uh, slide here, or in the graph here, that high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, sort of our established risk factors for cardiovascular disease are up at the top. So moving on then to what we know specifically about diet and cardiovascular disease, and there have been a number of attempts of systematically reviewing the evidence to look at the dietary risk factors for car uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, one of the first that was conducted and is still, I think, relevant, although of course there's been a lot of uh, evidence published since that time, was published in 2009 by Mente et al. And they looked at the evidence for a causal association between diet and CHD, and they ranked the evidence as strong, moderate, or weak. And we'll come back to this slide a little bit later, but at that time in 2009, the data for a Mediterranean diet was defined as being strong, uh, so strong evidence to support a role for Mediterranean diet um, in coronary heart disease. As I've said, there's been a lot of uh, data published since then, a lot of studies published, and uh, an updated, I suppose, consideration and quite a systematic consideration of the role of diet and cardiovascular disease was published by Mossafarian in 2016. Uh, it's a very useful review um, because they, he looked at things like um, the likely foods that may be important in cardiovascular disease, but also the likely mechanisms by which those foods were causing uh, a, you know, a, 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 an effect on cardiovascular disease risk. And at the end, summed up uh, by highlighting foods that may cause benefit in terms of heart disease outcomes, but also that those that may be uh, linked with uh, uh, an increase in risk um, of cardiovascular disease. And you can see things like fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, fish, vegetable oils, whole grains, beans, yogurt, beneficial foods, whereas things like refined grains, sugars, processed meats, uh, high salt foods, and trans fat rich foods um, associated with detrimental effects in terms of cardiovascular disease risk. For that reason, 
cardiovascular disease prevention guidelines, and this is the British Heart Foundation guidelines, they still very much focus on um, general healthy dietary guidelines. Um, so the British Heart Foundation has a section on healthy eating, but that then links straight to the UK dietary guidelines, um, the Eat Well Guide. And the Irish Heart Foundation also refers to uh, national dietary guidelines, in this case, the Food Pyramid. The American Heart Association is something very similar, so there's a focus on nutrition, but also on the other uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors. And the nutrition uh, guidance is very similar, again, to general dietary guidelines. Okay, so I'm going to then move on to talk about a specific dietary pattern, and this one that was mentioned in the Mente et al. systematic review um, as being having strong evidence linking that dietary pattern to uh, cardiovascular disease, and it's the Mediterranean diet. So it was Ansel Keyes, who was a, an American cardiologist, who first proposed as a result of the Seven co Countries study, it started in about 1958, um, that disease rates and dietary patterns both varied across countries, the countries included within his seven countries study. And he proposed that the traditional Mediterranean diet might be responsible. There are various definitions of a Mediterranean diet and I could spend most of a, a seminar discussing what are the key components of a Mediterranean diet. Um, but this is the uh, 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 one definition, uh, and it's the diet that emphasizes high in fruits, vegetables, breads, other forms of cereals, potatoes, beans, nuts, and seeds. Olive oil is consumed as an important fat source, and dairy products, fish, and poultry are consumed in low to moderate amounts. Eggs consumed zero to four times weekly, and little red meat is consumed. Wine is consumed in low to moderate amounts. But the key thing about this dietary pattern is that it's based on patterns that were common to Mediterranean regions, particularly Greece and southern Italy in the early 1960s, so it's a traditional dietary pattern. <coughs> Sometimes the Mediterranean diet is referred to in the form of a pyramid, because I think that is uh, useful for interpretation, and you can see here that at the bottom of the py pyramid, those foods that were consumed more frequently, such as fruit, veg, uh, nuts, olive oil, etc., are in the lower part of the pyramid. Um, and then as we rise up the pyramid, uh, foods are consumed less frequently, so meats and sweets at the top. What's interesting, and I'll just come back to it right at the end, is that there's a Mediterranean sort of overall lifestyle pattern, so that being physically active is mentioned. Um, sort of conviviality, enjoying meals with others, um, is also mentioned as part of the traditional pattern. And we have good observational evidence suggesting that increasing adherence to a Mediterranean diet is associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. So this is the latest version of a series of systematic reviews conducted by SOFI, so the last one published in 2014, showing that uh, a two-point increase in Mediterranean diet score is associated with a 10% reduction in cardiovascular disease risk. And the same has been um, examined for all-cause mortality and other, also other chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and various cancer sites. Um, and similar conclusions have been um, observed certainly for um, all-cause mortality. So that's observational evidence. We also have some intervention study evidence with clinical endpoints in terms of Mediterranean diet and cardiovascular disease. So in 1999, Delorgerel, um, who's a French cardiologist, published a secondary prevention intervention study. So he recruited, it was about 500 patients, no, about 600 patients who had just had a myocardial infarction, and he randomized them to receive Mediterranean diet advice um, and a MUFA rich spread, or to receive standard dietary advice at that time. The trial was stopped early because of this clear separation and survival curve, so a clear benefit of the Mediterranean diet on, it was a combined cardiovascular and overall mortality outcome. Um, so that's some evidence for a role of Mediterranean diet in the secondary prevention setting. And it was on that basis, that study published in 1999, that that Mente systematic review uh, rated the Mediterranean diet evidence as strong. We then have in 2013, I think it was, the PREDIMED study, which was a study conducted in the primary prevention setting. So recruiting people at high risk of heart disease but who do not have clinical evidence of the disease and randomising them to either follow a controlled diet or to consume a Mediterranean diet with additional nuts or a Mediterranean diet with additional extra virgin olive oil. <coughs> 
And this trial similarly showed a beneficial effect of the Mediterranean diet, either with nuts or olive oil, um, on cardiovascular outcomes. So the primary endpoint there was acute MI, stroke or death from cardiovascular causes. And you can see again clear separation between the control and the intervention groups. About a 30% reduction in risk. Um, didn't really matter whether there was extra olive oil or nuts according to those hazard ratios. So if we come back to that Mentes slide, so it was published in 2009. It was only uh, really based on that, well, the, the intervention study evidence from the Leon Diet Heart Study, the Delore Girl Study. But since then, we have this primary prevention study from PrediMed. And so for that reason, based on that evidence, uh, Mediterranean dietary advice is now recommended by NICE for the secondary prevention of CHD and has been for some time. And it's also starting to be mentioned in primary prevention guidelines and also indeed in general dietary guidelines. It's certainly cropping up um, and it's stimulated a lot of interest in the Mediterranean diet. We always try to be a little bit reductionist, um, I think, and wanting to know why it works. Um, so there's been some examination of whether, you know, what is the key health promoting component of the Mediterranean diet? And I don't think we really know as yet. So this was an analysis of the EPIC Greek cohort. Um, I looked at a two point increase in Mediterranean diet score, which was associated with lower CHD mortality in females and males. But when they started to look at the individual score components to try and work out which foods in particular might be associated with an increased or sorry, a reduced risk of CHD, the individual components were not associated with risk. Now that might have been a power issue, but I think it's probably more likely to be due to the fact that it's this overall dietary pattern that seems to be important. But there's probably more work to be done in this area. Okay, so that's the sort of background then leading into the work that we've been doing. I think we know that there are likely health benefits of following a Mediterranean diet. The question then becomes, how do we get populations to make changes towards a Mediterranean diet, and particularly in non-Mediterranean countries? If you look at the research literature in the area, it's extremely sparse. Um, the only real discussion is around the fact that Mediterranean countries seem to be losing their traditional dietary patterns, so they're losing that adherence to the traditional Mediterranean diet very little about trying to promote a Mediterranean diet in non-Mediterranean countries. So let's look at Northern Irish diet. Um, it's obviously not quite like that, um, but <laughs> it doesn't really resemble a Mediterranean diet. And certainly we know, this is from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, um, that we are not meeting uh, many of our uh, recommended uh, nutrient intakes. Um, particularly for things like saturated fat and for sugar intake. We're not meeting our fruit and veg target, et cetera, et cetera. Oily fish, fibre, both low. Um, so there's obviously scope for improving uh, a Northern Irish diet. There's obviously scope for increasing adherence to a Mediterranean diet in that population. We also have a strong agri-food sector, and there's a certain amount of pride in um, our uh, food production capabilities. So you sort of think that maybe there's something there that we could tap into. I'll, I'll come back to that later. So when I was a, a very junior researcher, um, my then ex-PhD supervisor and a cardiologist were very inspired by that Leon Diet Heart Study, the Delore Girl Study, the secondary prevention study. And they went to get funding to try and um, show that adherence to a Mediterranean diet in a secondary prevention setting in Northern Ireland, so going to heart disease patients and advising them to adopt a Mediterranean diet and demonstrating an effect on heart outcomes. They went for that funding and they were laughed out of the room um, because they said, you'll never get a Northern Irish population to follow a Mediterranean diet. So they were clearly a bit peeved by that. Um, and we sort of set out to then start to demonstrate that we could uh, get the Northern Irish population to make some changes. So this was a first go at it. Um, so this was a an MPhil student, so a dietitian who was funded by our local research and development office to do that MPhil. Um, and so we recruited, I think it was about 60 um, MI patients, uh, I think within about six months of having uh, had their MI. And we randomised them onto standard dietary advice that they, anybody would receive having had an MI, onto Mediterranean dietary advice given using standard sort of dietetic approaches and then what we called behavioural counselling, which was using, talking to the patient and seeing where they were in terms of their readiness to change their diet. So if somebody was really quite 
bought into the idea, they would have got different advice from somebody who said, look, I'm not really that interested. And you'd be giving your, tailoring your dietary advice accordingly. And we followed them up over a 12-month period. And we showed that Mediterranean diet score increased by about two and a half to three points. So it was on a nine-point scale, which is another complexity around how you measure adherence to Mediterranean diet. At that point, we used a nine-point scale. And we were getting people baseline of about two to three. And we were getting them up um, to five, six, seven, something around that at both six and 12 months in all our intervention groups. So the way we delivered the dietary advice didn't matter. They were all making changes towards the Mediterranean diet. And we were able to confirm that with some objective biomarkers of compliance. So that was a start. We were then fairly inspired by the publication of the PREDIMED study. The problem was with PREDIMED is that the dietary intervention was expensive and intensive. So the participants were meeting dietitians on I think it was a bi-monthly basis, I, I would need to check, but it was certainly involved um, health professional support and quite intensive health professional support. Delivery of the key foods, so delivery of the olive oil and the nuts. And in terms of rollout to general population, it really was never going to happen. Um, so what we decided to do was to seek funding to explore the feasibility of using peer support to encourage adherence to, Northern Ar uh, to Mediterranean diet and those at high risk of CBD. And we very much followed the frameworks that we now have to guide the development and evaluation of complex interventions. So there's an MRC framework um, that talks to you about the staging and how you develop an intervention. It talk, you know, talks about qualitative work with the target population, systematic reviews of the literature, and how you then build towards developing that intervention. Uh, those are the MRC guidelines there. And we applied for funding to the National Prevention Research Initiative in early 2013 and received the funding. So the first thing we did was then go and talk to our target group about, so this is people at high risk of CVD, about what they thought of the Mediterranean diet. Um, and we came up with a number of barriers to dietary change. Um, so things like cost, who's going to buy olive oil if you can buy lard, for example, it's significantly cheaper. Um, availability, saying that fresh fish uh, that was available didn't look fresh and uh, was a bit stinky when you opened it. Um, habit, my generation, you had a very stable diet. Your diet was red meat and potatoes and all that. That's what I was brought up on and that's what I would eat now. Um, resistance, so if you like your food, enjoy it. My motto is I'm coming 70, I'll eat whatever I want and enjoy it. Um, time, with shift working, it just depends. Maybe coming in late, it's easier to go and get a takeaway than to start to cook. Um, skills, so saying that we all eat, need to eat fruit and veg, but converting it into something is the problem and having to prepare it when you go home. And then a sort of lack of confidence in the media. Well, everything you touch one day, it's okay, and the next, it's not. I've just decided I'm not going to worry too much. I'm not going to listen to what they hear in terms of dietary advice. So some quite significant barriers there were coming through. It was interesting that most people were aware of a Mediterranean diet, um, but when, when probed, they had limited knowledge of its composition. Um, other things like acceptability, I don't mind cooking in the olive oil and rapeseed oil, but don't ask me to pour over pasta. Um, we eat the unhealthy nuts, the salted peanuts. Um, here we eat fish, but it's mainly fish and chips. Um, you make the dinner, if it's not a big chop or sausages, even mince and onions, it's not a proper dinner. Um, one of the other things that would work against this is the sort of cook time thing of not cooking, people buying ready made, queries about a sweet tooth. Concern about consuming a moderate fat diet, so being told to consume olive oil, said it's a lot of calories. Um, saying it's not natural to our way in Northern Ireland of eating. Um, so cultural issues and then climate. So it's not a diet that seems suited to our way of life. I mean our climate here really. So we knew then from that um, those sorts of comments around barriers and difficulties with the concept of changing towards a Mediterranean diet, that any intervention we produced needed to address or provide appropriate education and support to address those knowledge gaps and those barriers. And we went on to develop that. So we have a series now of um, seasonal recipes. We've adapted a lot of the recipes to be as close to usual foods consumed in Northern Ireland as possible. Those are accompanied by shopping lists and then lots of guidance around the, the purchasing, uh, the consideration of cost, the storage, the preparation. Um, so a whole series of diet resources that we developed based on that background uh, qualitative work. 
We also then talked about uh, peer support and what um, version of peer support people might like. So things like, would it be online? Would it be in groups? Would it be one-to-one? -one? Um, and again, we got a lot of comments back around the, the, the sort of uh, uh, preferred peer support method that they would want. And pretty much it came through, regardless of um, affluence, regardless of gender, regardless of age, that the group method was preferred. Now, we think that may be due to familiarity with things like Slimming World and Weight Watchers as group methods to encourage dietary change. Um, but that's what came through very strongly from the qualitative work. So we used that background material to design a peer support uh, intervention to encourage dietary change. It was based on that qualitative work that I've just described. It was based on uh, systematic reviews of the literature. Um, and we basically developed a group um, program with two peer supporters, up to 10 people per group, based on a social support uh, model, uh, based on the incorporation of behaviour change techniques, so things like goal setting. Um, and each component or each meeting had some written education and recipes provided, but also some educational component in the group meetings. We also asked our participants whether they, what they would like in terms of their peer support or were they looking for a sort of pseudo health professional or were they looking, what were they looking for, somebody who to talk to them about dietary change. So it came through that they needed to be empathetic, uh, it wouldn't last one conversation with me if I didn't think there was any empathy or understanding. They needed to know what they were talking about. Somebody that's going to listen, they've also got the same thing wrong with them as you have, they have experience. Somebody with good communication skills and somebody who wouldn't be judgmental. So again, we tried to listen to all that and we developed sort of screening um, for our ideal peer supporters. And then they completed a two-day training program and we assessed their sort of knowledge of um, the, the Mediterranean diet and our program before they were let loose on, a, on our groups. Okay, so that was the background work which we then have now pilot tested in the team med study. So it was to look at the feasibility of the peer support approach to encourage adoption and maintenance of a Mediterranean diet in comparison with the PREDIMED intervention. So we did have the intensive arm in there at this stage and then a minimal intervention. And our main endpoint was change the Mediterranean diet score at baseline to six months, which we called adoption of dietary change. That's just summarised here in a, in a figure. Uh, we recruited 75 people at high risk of heart disease and put them into these three groups. Our developed peer support intervention, the PREDIMED intervention where they had sessions with the dietitian and we provided the key foods, and then our minimal written Mediterranean diet advice. 44% of our participants were female, mean age 57, and they were, this is now a 14 point scale, so we've changed our, uh, the scale that we use to assess <coughs> adherence to a Mediterranean diet, so it was 9 points, it's now 14 points, and they really were not adhering to Mediterranean diets, there were two on a 14 point scale. And these are just the preliminary data, uh, we're still in the process of analysing, but regardless of support group allocation, so I can't actually see, it's the written um, experts, that was the written material only, so sort of control, expert group and our peer support group. We got very similar improvements in Mediterranean diet score. But we got improvements in Mediterranean diet score, that's the median of about five point increase um, over a six month period. So all within group dis differences, this study, it's a pilot study, it wasn't really hard to detect effect sizes, but clearly we want to have a look and see did we get changes. Um, but all within group differences were statistically significant at all time points. As I've said, we're still analysing the data and what we aim to do is use the data on the primary outcome to, do, to define the power required for a definitive trial. We also looked at a range of secondary outcomes and we saw reductions in HbA1c, which is a marker of long-term glucose control. We saw reductions in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure um, and those were maintained over the period of the study. And we're also still completing analysis of objective biomarkers of nutritional status. But we're very encouraged by the outcome of the pilot study and hope to take it further. We accompanied this pilot study by what we call process evaluation, where we look at to see where the challenges arose in the delivery of the study protocol and you know, what, what would we need to change if we go back and do a definitive trial. We did struggle to recruit our 75, so I keep... <laughs> might be blinding somebody in the front row because I was <laughs> pointing at it. Um, I do apologise. Um, 
We did find it challenging to recruit people at high risk of CVD with low Mediterranean diet adherence who wanted to take part in the study. So that was certainly a challenge and we'll need to factor um, A, our inclusion and exclusion criteria, but also our timeline for recruitment in a bigger study. Attendance was te tended to be pretty good at the start, but it did decline across meetings and there were various reasons for that. So, you know, things like other aspects of life just cropping up. Uh, interpersonal factors, some of the groups worked really well, others did not work so well, so there was a feeling of some of being let down by fellow group members. And then there were some things that we can definitely change around the use of reminder messages, making sure people know if there's been a change of location. Um, we didn't have our st group meetings at regular intervals, they tailed off over the course of the one year period, but people really wanted that regularity just to know that it was a once a month meeting, so we will change that. Having said that, there were high levels of fidelity to the study protocols in terms of the numbers of meetings, the format of the meetings that we had guided our peer supporters on, that worked. And there was a high level of acceptability to the Mediterranean diet. It was uh, rated on a five point scale and the mean was 1.15, so, so pretty high levels of acceptance. The components rated most acceptable were consuming fruit and veg, whole grains and olive oil, and those least acceptable were avoiding sweet foods, moderating alcohol intake and consuming legumes. So again, that's interesting based on then how we deliver our dietary advice in a bigger study. Um, and again, you know, generally positive feedback. We did qualitative interviews with most of our participants and certainly anybody dropping out, um, but also all our peer supporters and everybody in the peer support arm. Um, and I'll let you read it yourselves, but there was a, you know, it, there were positive uh, f comments both from members of the peer support group, but also from the peer supporters. Um, so we will hope to take this forward and seek further funding. Now, just to mention briefly, um, while we were conducting the main team med study, um, it became apparent peer support has been pretty much discussed most extensively in the diabetes prevention and management literature. Mm -hmm. So it became apparent when we were um, doing the first study that uh, in the diabetes literature that it may be that, that peer support works best when you know the people in your peer support group um, so that um, you're not trying to build those sort of social support networks, you're not trying to build bonds with people that you don't know but you already know these people and you're comfortable with them. So we decided to try and get a little bit of further funding to, to test that out and see whether that also was the same in a dietary intervention setting. So we called this the T-Med Extend study. It was funded by Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke. Um, and, you know, again, just as I've said, that individual level randomisation that we had done um, created new peer support groups. People didn't know each other. Um, and suggesting that already established groups would have people with similar socio-demographic uh, characteristics and they may therefore have greater social cohesion and engagement uh, compared to those people who are trying to form relationships uh, if we put them into new groups. So we were funded to uh, test the peer support intervention, no intensive intervention this time, just peer support versus uh, education only. Um, and you know, pretty small study, again, it was just a pilot study, but recruited four community groups. They had to be established, drawn from one community network or centre. People had to attend regularly. We had to ha make sure that people were going to be coming along to the groups. And we wanted them to be homogeneous in gender where possible. Um, in terms of individuals from the community groups who could then take part in the study, they had to be aged over 40. Um, have a Mediterranean diet score less than five um, and at least one CVD risk factor. So we, we, we moderated our, the strictness of our inclusion criteria slightly in this study. Um, and what we want were true peer support type groups. We didn't want community groups led by health professionals because that, that sort of restricts then the possibility of rollout or the, you know, the reduced, the likely cost effectiveness um, in terms of rollout. They could not be led by a health professional. And we again recruited peer supporters, um, very similar criteria to the past uh, or the previous study, um, and they again were, went through some training. So this time we um, gave some information to 10 community groups. We screened eight of them and ultimately recruited four. And those community groups were randomised on the group level to an educational intervention, two groups, and a peer support intervention, two groups. 
The educational intervention simply received that written educa or educational material based on the Mediterranean diet that I showed you the photograph of. And then the others received this um, group program with the education sessions, etc., uh, over a 12 month period. And the primary outcome, similar change in Mediterranean diet score at six months. Now again, we've only just, well, we finished quite a while, but we're still analysing um, this study. Um, our primary outcome was change in Mediterranean diet score at six months. And you can see the peer support group managed a, about a three-point increase in Mediterranean diet score, and it's slightly higher, but still around three in the education group. This was not statistically significant, but certainly the two groups doing similarly well, if not the education group doing slightly better um, compared to the peer support group. And also slightly lower levels of increase in Mediterranean diet score in this study. There are some reasons for that, which I'll, I'll maybe mention in a second. The secondary outcome was the maintenance at 12 months. So what you'd be seeing if you would, there was a negative score here it would mean that people maybe had increased Mediterranean diet score and then it was dropping off by 12 months. It's not. It's at least being maintained, if not slightly enhanced, um, over the 12-month period. But again, no um, evidence of... Um, significant differences between the groups, although again, their pilot studies, they weren't really hard to detect that. So peer support and edu in education groups both increased Mediterranean diet score at six months. Those scores were maintained at 12 months. There was a 50% dropout rate in the peer support group, um, which of course then we would need to factor into a future study and trying to explore the reasons for that dropout rate in the peer support group. So the true effect of the peer support intervention might be underestimated due to the comparison with the minimal education intervention. So what we're seeing in both studies is that education material has actually induced a similar level of behaviour change as our more contact, more complex, more, more uh, invasive inter peer support intervention. Um, and so we may have done too good a job, in fact, with the education uh, material uh, development. But again, we're still exploring those data. The process evaluation for this study is ongoing. So where are we going with this? Um, we need to complete process evaluation and analysis for both studies. Uh, we've published both sets of qualitative work that led to the development of the educational material. The developmental work of the peer support intervention um, is um, under review at the moment, as is the protocol. Um, and then we need to get on with the um, publication of the main outcomes. Ultimately, what we want to do is design definitive trials that will test the effect of our intervention on Mediterranean diet adherence. Ultimately, what we'd like to do is to demonstrate that increased adherence, whether it has an effect on clinical efficacy, so heart disease outcomes. Um, because while it's been shown in PREDIMED, that has been shown in a Mediterranean population. Um, the PREDIMED participants had a baseline Mediterranean diet score of somewhere 7 to 9 on the 14 point scale, whereas we're talking about people who are on a score of sort of between 2 and 5. Um, so so it, quite a different population, both culturally and also in terms of their baseline adherence to a Mediterranean diet. So I think that clinical efficacy study should still be done in a non Mediterranean population. So those two sort of study designs would deal with these two questions. To what extent will non-Mediterranean populations adopt a Mediterranean diet? And what are the health benefits of adopting a Mediterranean diet by a non-Mediterranean population who is not or at low levels of adherence? I think it's interesting to explore, and this comes back to the concept of what is a Mediterranean diet, and there are lots of regional variations in the definitions of a Mediterranean diet as you move around the Mediterranean region. How can we, and we've tried to do it with our educational material, but how can we adapt a Mediterranean diet using more local foods that are more familiar, more culturally acceptable? Um, and there's some interest now in looking at the sustainability of food production and supply, um, both in the Mediterranean region and then more broadly. And then the final point which I'd made earlier at the bottom of that Mediterranean diet pyramid around the, this broader Mediterranean lifestyle and eating together as a family, accompanying physical activity, etc. We haven't dealt with that at all in our interventions. We have simply looked at the key food groups that make up a Mediterranean diet. And that's something that could ex be explored, whether that enhances 
a health benefit of a Mediterranean diet. So I just wanted to finish up by talking a little bit about uh, the current funding streams in the UK and how they are slightly changing and that will also change how we maybe approach behaviour change interventions. Um, so I think to change diet in a long term way, so sustainably in terms of maintenance of the behaviour change and to do it in a cost effective way that could be rolled out to the general population and actually you know, make a difference is very difficult. I have very much as a researcher concentrated on individual level uh, dietary change, but there are clearly a whole range of levels of intervention at which we can approach um, initiatives to change uh, dietary behaviour or eating behaviour. So that might be looking at the environment, say in schools, in workplaces, or it might be more governmental sort of subsidies, taxes, uh, etc. And of course, sugar tax has been rolled out in the UK within the past week or so. So there's lots of complexity <coughs> in terms of how we approach behaviour change. Um, if we think about food specifically, we can think about this as the Nuffield Bioethics Intervention Ladder, which ranges from things like do nothing, um, provide information, but right up to eliminating choice in terms of um, behaviours. We can do things like encourage intake of healthy foods through raising awareness of health benefits, and that's really what we've been doing in our studies. Educate on chopping and food, cooking skills, and we've been doing some of that within the Mediterranean diet interventions. Increase the availability of healthy foods outside the home, for example, restaurants, other eating establishments, and then moving into the more uh, eliminating choice or reducing choice by reducing the cost of healthy foods and increasing the cost of less healthy foods. So there's a whole range, again, of approaches. That has been summarised again by Mossiferian, so again a really good review in terms of heart disease and what we might do to affect behaviour change and you know, the, the evidence around diet and, and uh, cardiovascular disease. And again talking about approaches using the media and education, changing the environment at schools and workplaces, right through to things like um, economic incentives and again that's the sort of taxation and subsidy type approaches. But what's interesting in that the Team Med study was funded under the National Prevention Research Initiative and that was, that was a really major initiative in the UK because it brought together government departments, research councils and major medical charities to work together to promote prevention research. Um, and it made a fairly major uh, funding commitment over four funding calls. Last awards made, I said 2011 there, but they are actually coming through in 2012-2013. That has now closed and that has been replaced by something called the Prevention Research Partnership where the first round of uh, funding call closed in January, um, so it was launched late in 2017. That is now again sort of linking together these different funders to promote prevention research but individual level behaviour change interventions will no longer be funded. It's focusing on these upstream determinants, so these higher level environment and um, uh, broader upstream determinants of behaviour change that they will now fund. So something individual level will not be funded. So it's, it's interesting to see how that has changed within the UK and the funding opportunities available. Okay, so to summarise, um, hopefully I've shown to you that Mediterranean diet improves cardiovascular outcomes and that's been shown in both the primary and secondary prevention setting. What we're less certain about are the effects in non-Mediterranean regions. The Mediterranean diet interventions that we have in the literature are mostly efficacy studies looking at either clinically relevant outcomes or looking at likely mechanisms. So we have much less in terms of looking at behaviour change. We know that achieving long-term dietary behaviour change is difficult, but I think what we've tried to show um, or we've tried to approach it, that it is important to do it in you know, small stages and build that important, conduct that important formative research, the qualitative work, the systematic <coughs> reviews, uh, the interaction with your target group to talk to them about what works to maximise the long-term acceptability and effectiveness of interventions to promote dietary behaviour change. So I'd just like to thank, there's been quite a big team uh, of people working on the TMED and the TMED Extend studies. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and happy to t take any questions.